In this video, we want to show you how to actually control your miners or your house with Home Assistant. What we have over here um, is a setup we're building, we're calling it the Hashtop, which is basically a mobile Bitcoin mining hot tub. On this side over here, we see the electrical side. We're not going to go into details how exactly each piece works, but we want to show you how to connect the Home Assistant, which is over here. So this is a Raspberry Pi, which will run Home Assistant, to our controller board. This controller board is an ESP32 controller board with eight relays, um, plus also the capability to have additional sensors. We're going to go into this later. And this is basically connected to the whole system over here, which allows us to turn on and off specific relays. Um, and also, if we go, if you look over here, this is the whole pumping system. We see additional sensors that we're also going to connect to it. Uh, the first step to do all of this, we need to install Home Assistant on the Raspberry Pi. To do this, we need to install Home Assistant on an SD card. So let me show you how we do this over here. Um, so the first thing we want to do is if we go to Home Assistant install, If you just go to the website, we see there is a uh, simple way how to install um, a Raspberry Pi. The most important thing is we want our um, Raspberry Pi imager. Um, so I already have this installed on my computer. This Raspberry Pi imager, I can now choose a device. Um, we have Raspberry Pi 4s. Unfortunately, Home Assistant does not support Raspberry Pi 5 yet. Um, so we use a Raspberry Pi 4 and now instead of taking one of these Raspberry Pi's versions here we have, um, if we scroll down, we have other specific purpose OS and one of them says Home Assistant and Home Automation and in here we have Home Assistant and we can select that one directly. Um, and now we can choose a storage. I already connected a 60 gigabyte um, SD card to my computer and I want to install this. So this is a very simple way to install Raspberry Pi on top um, of an SD card. And this will take a couple of seconds. Alrighty, this is done. It's now verifying that everything has been installed. Okay, and we're done. We can eject that. So I will take out the SD card and we'll put it into the Raspberry Pi. There we go. Okay, and now all we need to do is turn on um, the Raspberry Pi and it will boot up um, our uh, Home Assistant. Alright, our Raspberry Pi is up and running. Uh, we can see the red light that is starting to flash. Now this will take a couple of minutes um, because Home Assistant at the very beginning needs to boot up and do all kinds of things. So we're going to pause here and we'll be right back. All right, a couple of minutes have passed. Um, we can see the Raspberry Pi is still the, the yellow LED, which is the LED that shows indication that um, something is happening, is continuously blinking. Um, usually you have wait a couple of minutes. So what we can do now, uh, if we go over to the screen, now we need to find the IP address of our Raspberry Pi. Um, in the explanation or in the installation of Home Assistant, it tells us that we can go to homeassistant.local8123. Now in my system, I already have a Home Assistant running and only one Home Assistant can have this, IP, this URL. So for that, I actually need to find the IP address of the Home Assistant. Now every system is going to be slightly different. Um, in my 
um, setup, I can actually go to the router. So this is my configuration of my router, and I can see a new IP address um, that has been shown up um, just a couple of minutes ago. Um, how this works in yours, it really depends, but usually all the routers have a list of all the devices, and we can actually see the host name is Home Assistant. So what we do is we copy this IP address, and as in the documentation, um, it tells us to go to HTTP slash slash IP address and then 8123. So I'm going to do this here. Going to go here, HTTP, and then to 8123. And now we see the Home Assistant UI is reloading. That's the, what we want to see. And it's telling us now that this will take up to 20 minutes. I mean, if we actually go to the details, we can see that um, while the SD card has Home Assistant installed already, it still needs to verify a couple of things and actually download the newest version from the internet. So while all this is happening, uh, you just stay on the screen and it will tell you as soon as this is all done and that we're up and running and we can continue. Okay, um, the installation is done um, and we can start to create my smart home. So I'm gonna go in here and I'm just gonna use um, just uh, admin, 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 that's the easiest. Of course, don't do that uh, for your systems or people can turn on your minus on and off, that's what we want, but as a demo here, we just use that. We create an account. It asks us for the location, it's not necessary. And um, it asks you which country. Again, this is not necessary that you need to select the correct country. It just will correct the, use the correct units from the very beginning. And we click Next. It asks you if you want to upload any analytics data. Um, Home Assistant is completely only running on your Raspberry Pi, so you don't need to do this. And it will automatically also show us existing devices that, that they have been added. So it actually scans your local network. So what we now have running is we have a um, home assistant running on this Raspberry Pi. Um, but by itself, um, the Raspberry Pi cannot control sensors or look to therm thermal temperature sensors and things like that. For that, we actually need one of these boards here. Um, as I mentioned, this is an ESP32. This is a small microcontroller that can be used for all kinds of different things. And in this specific board, there are a lot of different ones. They're directly connected to relays. Um, and as I said, there's also headers that we can connect temperature sensors and other stuff. Um, um, so what we want to do is we want to, as a first step, now control these relays from our home assistant. For that, we need to connect um, the ESP32 to um, the home assistant. Now, by default, the ESP32 has Wi-Fi, so this is pretty simple to connect to. Um, you can also do it through Ethernet, um, but we are not going to do this today. Um, just the Wi-Fi is much easier. Now, to set this all up, um, we need to connect and we need to flash the firmware of this ESP32 that it knows to actually talk to uh, Raspberry Pi. To do this, this specific board has an, a little uh, flashing chip or flashing connector that connects to the USB um, of, our, um, of our ESP. And we just connect this to our computer there. All right. Now, if we look over at our screen, um, the system we want to install is called ESP Home. So ESP Home is, as we see, this is the same chip that we just saw before. This is the thing that you can use to connect to Home Assistant. Um, it's not the only thing. You can also connect to other home automation system, but it's built by the same community and so it's quite simple and um, very easy. All right, to do this, um, again, there is an installation or there is a documentation on how to add ESP Home to Home Assistant. Um, so what we do, we go over to Home Assistant um, and there is a part under Systems, there is an add-on. Um, we can go to our store and we can search for ESP Home. 
So this ESP Home is basically the add-on to Home Assistant. So then we can control these to these microcontrollers. So we're going to click on install here, and this will take a couple of seconds to download and then run everything. All right, um, ESP Home has been downloaded. We can start it up now. And there's also an easy button here that says show in sidebar. So you can actually access ESP Home directly always from the sidebar over here. So we click on this and now we are inside the ESP Home dashboard and we can just click new device. Um, it will tell us now that it needs to be connected to the computer and that's done. And um, in order to actually install all of this, we just um, click on, there's a lot of different ways um, to install this. Um, and so for this now, we're going to choose ESP Home Web. All right, we click on ESP Home Web. This opens up another website. Um, and in here, it tells us that we can connect um, to our ESP Home. Now, we are going to need to use Chrome in this specific case because Chrome can actually directly, the browser can talk to USB devices. And so we can see here our USB single zero is already there. We can connect to it. And now um, the Chrome browser can talk to our USB device directly. And we can say, prepare your device for first use. Um, and we say we want to install this. Now, what this will do, this will now flash ESP Home in, onto our ESP32. Um, this is super simple and makes it much easier through the browser. Like I said, there's other ways to do this, but this really has been so far the easiest way. All right, uh, the configuration has been installed and uh, we can close this now. It will now connect to our ESP Home directly and because we want to connect this to Wi-Fi, it will now ask us for our Wi-Fi credentials. So this is already the correct Wi-Fi. I connect my, enter my password and it will now, um, or it automatically configure the device. Um, we can now visit this device and it will open up the IP address of our ESP Home. And we can see this is like a small web UI of the ESP Home itself. So we're talking now directly to that microcontroller. Um, and on here, um, we can't do a lot, but we can verify that it all works. Now, if we go back to our Home Assistant, Home Assistant now realizes that there is a new device and we can adopt this, which is really nice. So um, we can click, uh, click on this adopt name and it asks me now um, to give it a name. Um, so I will uh, give this the, um, I will call this the hash top control system. Um, it again asks me for my Wi-Fi. Um, it's just going to need this again um, to correctly configure it. So I'm going to shortly copy this. All right. Enter the password and I click adopt. It basically now, um, so it connected to this, it configured all of it. Um, it tells me though that this, uh, like the configuration needs to be installed. Um, and we can click install. Now this, what this will do is actually compile and configure the specific firmware for that device. So before we just installed the general firmware, but this now is a specific firmware for that device with this home assistant, the Wi-Fi credentials and all these things. This will take, the first one will take quite a bit um, because it actually needs to compile some stuff. Um, subsequent installations will go much faster. All right, um, our installation of the ESP32 system has been done. Um, it took like four or five minutes and we can now see that um, it actually connected to all of it and um, it shows us a nice um, system. Um, this is the output of the ESP Home uh, running on the ESP32, meaning we can see like which Wi-Fi is connected, things like that. Um, so we can't go out of here. Now, one thing I like to do, we can see the while it's actually called hash tube control, the UI or the YAML for it is still called what the random name was from before. Um, so I'm actually going to change the host name as well. So I call this hash top 
control. This is the name that also will show up in your Wi-Fi and things like that. It's just much easier to find. So we change this name, rename it, and it will now do another flash um, of the whole system. And this will take another two minutes. All right, uh, the installation has been done and we can see now that our um, ESP Home is now called Hashtop Control, much simpler. Um, and we can click on it, we can look at the logs as we just did before. So this way we know that the ESP Home is um, connected. Now, um, the ESP Home though by itself does not know actually what is connected to all its inputs and outputs. And for that we need to tell it, um, we need to tell it what it actually has. And if we go back to our ESP Home documentation, we can actually see that there's a lot of different sensors and components that um, we can connect to it. Um, we can interact with the ESP, uh, with the Home Assistant and all that different stuff. So what we want to do is we want to connect a GPIO um, switch. Um, so if you go search for GPIO switch, we can see here that it tells us that um, this is what we need to configure or we need to do to actually configure the switch. Um, to configure all of this, we go back to our own Home Assist and we click on Edit. Now this is a YAML file or a configuration file that will actually be sent to ESP Home to um, configure all the different things um, and tell it what it has. Um, but if we look back in the GPIO, we see that we need to define the pin. So it tells me pin, the GPIO pin to use for this switch. Now, if we go shortly back to the camera, we can see um, we have on the DSP32 has eight different relays and each of them is connected to one specific GPIO pin. And um, so the ESP32 itself has all these different pins here. So one of them is connected to this relay board. The board itself, unfortunately, doesn't tell us which GPIO pin that it is. For to know that, we need to go to the documentation. So I have here the schema of our um, eight port relay and um, by the way this is a LilyGo T relay called and um, which I use a lot for different things and um, mostly yes because they already have relays on there and we can see here there's the K1 relay and it says control IO 33 so this is connected to the um, GPIO pin 33 of our ESP32 <laughs> so what we need to do now is we copy this over here we copy this code um, go to Home Assistant, go at the very end and paste this in. Um, so we tell it this is a switch, the platform is GPIO, there's a lot of different platforms, there's Bluetooth, serial, things like that, and we need to define the pin. Um, we say oh, here it is pin 33, um, so we define this and then we can also give it a name um, and in this case let's just call it Relay1, it's going to be the easiest for now. Um, in our system, this is actually going to be the pump. Um, no, let's call it the oil pump. Um, we can also give this a nicer ID. Um, so I call this switch oil pump. So to recap, this basically tells our ESP Home that on pin 33, there's a GPIO um, switch. It has the nice name oil pump and the ID is switch oil pump. The ID will be used for if you want to internally reference this and things like that. So now we can install this. Um, we can click on the top right to install. We can say wirelessly. So this will now compile the configuration again and send it to the um, ESP32. And if everything is right, we should see that um, this switch will show up in Home Assistant. So we let this compile. All right, um, compiling is done. Now, this is actually, sometimes this can happen. We can see there's an error in resolving the IP address. Um, I don't know if it's just for me, but this happens sometimes. All you do is just retry, and it will basically try again to compile or to send the config to the ESP home.
Alrighty, the second time it actually went through um, and it was able to load this all up and um, we can see this output again, which is what we want. Okay, um, now the really cool stuff of all of this is that we can actually now control this GPIO pin or this switch from Home Assistant itself. To do this, we go to Settings and Devices. Um, this shows us all kind of different devices that um, are connected to our um, system. And we see here the hash top control that, we, that has been discovered but not configured yet. So I copy this over here and say, do you want to add the ESP nodes to Home Assistant? Yes, I want this. And um, I could now say um, different areas. Home Assistant has like it assigns devices. I don't need this. But we now see the configured we have on the ESP Home. We see our hash top control. And by the way, there's other um, ESP Homes in my house as well. So that's why they show up here. But basically, um, if I click on that specific device, we see our control, the oil pump, and this is a switch. So how this works is now the ESP Home, we told it, it has a switch. And the ESP Home now told the Raspberry uh, Home Assistant that there's a switch. And I can now click on this. And we can see if we go over to the camera, every time that I turn this on and off on my home assistant, the relay will connect and the blue LED tells me that this actually works. If we go back to the screen, this is how it looks here. So every time I, I press this, I can turn it on and off. And there's also a logbook that tells me. And now the really cool stuff is I can actually configure all of this through automation and scripts. So obviously, not only uh, can I control these relays with, um, with mouse, I can also connect, let's say, a temperature sensor and automatically turn on and off specific things. And that's what we're going to do next, is to connect a temperature sensor to our ESP home and automatically control some miners from it. All right, so we want to now, as next step, connect a temperature sensor to our ESP32 board, which then the home assistant can read the temperature. And based on the temperature, we can turn off relays or maybe or also turn off the miners themselves. For that, we need a couple of things. Uh, first of all, we need a way to connect. So these pins are the GPIO pins that will be connected to the temperature sensor and we're going to use one of these cables um, and in our case let's assume the temperature sensor is actually some distance away we don't want to obviously run the temperature sensor directly on here we want to put them a little bit away so for this we're going to run from these GPIO pins to this breakout board over here in this breakout board we're going to connect and ribbon cable. So this cable will basically forward all these 20 connectors here, will be forwarded. And we have a second one of these over here. And we're also gonna connect this one in here. So basically these 20 connectors are connected to these 20 connectors. And so we can now connect these to the ESP32. And on the other side, we can connect our temperature sensor. Now, the temperature sensor is a so-called DS18B20. It's a very simple, cheap, but very good um, temperature sensor. And the really cool thing is it's actually waterproof. So you could put this in water and it's completely enclosed. Um, but we can also use it to measure the room temperature or the temperature of anything else. This um, temperature sensor has three wires uh, or three leads. We have a ground, we have a voltage or a plus voltage, and we have a data pin. Now, to connect them, we can just connect them directly to one of these, um, each one of the to these um, breakouts. So we're going to look, we're going to start at number 10, because the pin 10 is not used yet. So the pin 10, I'm going to make sure it's open. And this one in here. The ground I will put into number 11.
and the data pin, which is the yellow one, we put into number 12. Okay, so 10, 11, and 12. Now, if you shortly go over here on the screen, um, we can look at the data set for one of these DS18V20. And one of the things we see is that we see the yellow, the red, and the ground. So the ground, we need to connect to ground, that's obvious. The red one, we also need to connect to 3.3 volts of the ESP32, which is great. And the yellow one, we need to connect to one of the GPIO pins of our ESP32, but also we need to connect a resistor between the yellow wire and the red wire. Um, now these DSB18, DS18B20, they're so-called one wire, meaning you can actually connect multiple of these chips, uh, of these sensors next to each other in parallel, and they will all be able to read. We can show this later. Um, so that means we can now do the ESP32 side and connect this also to it. Um, if we go back to our little image that we used before already to check which uh, relay we can use, we also see there's a pinout over here and we also see that we have a different EIO pins as well, plus we have a ground, we have a 3.3 volt and let's say we have the IO14. So we want to use the IO14, the ground and the 3.3 volt to connect to our temperature sensor. So we go back to the camera and let's look at this. So we need three connectors. So I'm going to pull out three of these over here. And if we go, we can decide already now what we want to use. So I want to use black as ground, white I'm going to use as 3.3 and the gray is going to be used, the data pin that we connected to GPIO. So we go also remove them on the other side and get my wire strippers and strip them off all right so we need to get a bit close here and we can see these gpio pins um, that are out there they're also marked on the board itself so we know the first one over here is ground so we connect it to that one. Then the other one over here says 3.3. We connect it there. And the last one is the IO14 that we connected over there. So that's how they're connected. And now we want to connect them to the breakout board over here that we already have. We remember that the... Um, Plus or positive is number 10, ground is 11, and data is 12. So if you go over here, we have the same numbers also on this side. So we can connect ground to number 11. So I'm going to take here, open up number 11, run this in here and close it up. Okay, now we take the um 3.3 volt so that's the 3.3 one this one is connected to number 10 so i'm going to open 10 and also connect this and the data port to 12. open this one up and also connect this one in there now if we go back shortly to the screen just to recap so we have now done ground is connected to ground, red to 3.3, and uh, data is connected to the number 14 that we have over here. So we have 14, ground, and 3, which are basically these three pins here. One piece that is missing is the resistor. So we now need, also need to connect 3.3 to our um, GPIO pin, and we're actually going to do this over here. So we want to connect this resistor. This is the correct 4.7 kilo ohms uh, resistor. And I want to connect this one to our, between the yellow and the red, 
So I'm basically gonna, I'm gonna cut them a little bit off just to make them a bit shorter. Okay. And now I'm going to open them up a little bit. And put our resistor in there. Like this. And close them again. All right. They're in there. Okay, so we connected our temperature sensor, ground to 11, 10 to plus, 12 to data. We go over here, ground to 11 is number black, goes all the way on the top here, we see ground there. Plus is 10, or um, the DC plus is 10. This goes to the yellow, to the white, which is 3.3. And then also the 12 volt, the number 12, which is a data pin, goes to GPIO 14. Okay. Going over to our screen, now we need to tell, as we did with the, with the GPIO, we need to tell our ESP32 about this. So on the ESP Home um, star page, we can look for DS18B20. And we can see that there is a temperature sensor that shows up here and it tells us how to configure this. So we go over to our home assistant, go to ESP home and click on our hash top control. And we want to add this configuration now here. So we copy this whole configuration over here and add it in there. Now, the first thing that it asks us is which pin have we connected all of them? If we go back to our image, we have them connected to IO 14. So we add in there pin 14 and um, that's where they are. Now, the individual sensors, we define them as sensors. The platform is Dallas. Um, these sensors are also called Dallas one wire or DS18B20, it's the same. So we can put them in there. Now we need to know the address of the sensor. The problem is the address is actually not written on the sensor itself. But what we can do is we can tell the ESP to tell us all the sensors that they exist. So what we're going to do, we're just going to comment this for now and just install this. And the next time or after this has been installed, when the ESP boots, it will tell us all the different sensors that it will find and then we can copy the number from it. So as usual, this will take a couple of seconds or maybe a couple of minutes and we'll be right back. Okay, compiling was done and now it is uploading. And it's a reboot in the ESP32. Now, if everything went correctly, we should see our sensor showing up. And here it is. So we can see it now started up. It started the Dallas sensor uh, plugin and it tells us a sensor that was found. So we can copy now this sensor number and go back into our edit mode and uncomment this and use the address here. So this way we can tell it, hey, this is the temperature um, sensor. And we can give this uh, my, let's say I call this garage temperature. I'm also going to give it an ID, temp garage, for example. Now, one other thing is these Dallas pins, if you look at the documentation, um, the update interval of them is every 60 seconds, which for the demonstration it takes quite some time, so I want this a bit faster. So I'm going to copy the update interval and put it in here and call this around two seconds. So that means um, the ESP32 will check every two seconds if for the temperature and send it back to Home Assistant. All right, this is done. I will now install this again. This will run the same thing again. It will compile and will install um, the new configuration into the ESP. All right, it is compiled and it's uploading. As all the time, the ESP will now restart. Okay. 
Okay, it still found, tells us our sensor and it now tells us that current temperature that the temperature sensor is loading. Now, if we go to the camera, if I take this now into my hand and warm it up and go back to the screen, we can see that the temperature is rising. So it was at 21 degrees Celsius, it's 23, 25, 26, 27, and if I let it go again, I just let it sit around again, we should see that the temperature is going down again. So it was at 29, it's now 28.6, and going down further. Now, of course, we don't want to read it in here, that's just our log. What also happened at the same time is that if we go back to our devices, to our ESP home, and to our hash top control, we now see that we not only have the oil pump, but we also have the garage temperature and Home Assistant actually automatically converts this from Celsius to Fahrenheit. So we can see also here um, the current temperature. So what we can do with this now is we could tell it if the temperature is above a specific level, we want to turn on the relay. Um, and we can do this with automations. So if I click here, on plus automation, um, I want to do if um, the garage temperature changes, so I can select this one here, and I can tell it if the garage temperature changes, let's say above, um, let's say 80 degrees Fahrenheit, um, I can say, so if this is, this is a trigger, I can say that, and the condition, so I could add specific conditions, in this case I don't want to do this, but I can add actions, and I can say, hey, on the device, on my hash top control, turn on the oil pump. So I want to save this and say, turn on oil pump when, temp when garage temp above 80 Fahrenheit. So I want to do this, and if I go back, um, I can see now my automations over here. Now I also want to uh, duplicate that one, because I also want to say that if the temperature is below 80 degrees Fahrenheit, I want to turn it off. So I duplicate the whole thing, and I say not if we are above 80, but if we're below 80, and the action is, I don't want to turn the pump on, obviously, I want to turn the pump off. So I set this, click on save, and say, turn oil pump off when garage below 80. And this is it. So if we go to settings, automations, we can see now our two um, systems that we currently configured. And if we go back to our devices, to the ESP, the hash top, we can see now the garage temperature right now is at 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and if I take that in my hand, then we can see, go over here, and we should see, I will call out the temperature, it's at 77 now, 79, 81. So automatically the pump was turned on, and as we try to cool it off again, it's at 84 now. Let me get something cold a little short. All right, I have an ice pack here. I'll put the temperature sensor into the ice pack. And it will go down quite fast. And we saw the temperature was turned off. If you look at the screen, how this works. So temperature right now is 73. I take it in my hand and the temperature goes up and we're above 80. The oil pump automatically turned on. Put the, put the ice pack on the temperature sensor and we're going down and this turns the oil pump automatically off. So this is a way how we can control our um, we can use any sensor and also tell the miners to turn on and off automatically. 
Now, of course, what we're doing is we're actually turning on our um, a relay over here. Now, in our case, how we configured all of this, this relay actually controls this outlet. Um, and we have multiple outlets for the miners and things like that. Um, while this is one way, um, the miners actually have an API to control the miners to turn on and off. And we can also teach the Home Assistant to talk to the miners automatically to turn the miners on and off as well. This is a bit faster and maybe also in some cases better than actually disconnecting the power from the miners directly. And that's what we're going to do as last. I'm going to show you how to do this. We want to control our miners from Home Assistant directly. So for example, if the temperature of the sensor that we just connected automatically goes above a specific level, we want to tell the miner to turn off. And if the temperature goes below a specific level, we want to turn the miner back on. Now to do this, there is an integration that a couple of people from the Bitcoin community built together with myself that um, allows the Home Assistant to talk to the APIs of different miners. There's a list of the different miners on the project itself. And we can see, for example, if we run um, Brains OS Plus, um, we can run, we can control S19J Pros. Um, I do have an S19J Pro running right now. This is in, in the garage upstairs and it's currently mining. Um, don't be scared, it only has one hash port in it because I'm playing with some stuff. Um, it's actually running on 110 volts um, with a low keyboard. But um, what we would like to do is now to control this miner to turn on and off based on the temperature of the room. So to install this, we actually have to first install another tool called Hux. Hux is the Home Assistant Community Store that allows you to um, add additional plugins to Home Assistant that are not official Home Assistant plugin. Our plugin is not yet an official plugin, so we're going to need to use this. Um, if you go to the Hex um, download page, um, it actually tells us to first install another tool. I know it sounds a bit crazy, but unfortunately that's how it has to be done. So the first thing is we need an SSH tool. To do this, we go to add-ons, click on add-on store, search for SSH. We have our SSH web terminal, we install this, and this will now install an SSH terminal so we then can install Hux. Okay, the installation is done. Now before we start it, we need to configure it and uh, we need to give it a password. So I'm gonna give this the password the same. Maybe don't do this if you do it, but um, just for the demo, we save it here and we can go back and we can start it. This will start the SSH terminal. Um, as with the ESP Home, we can also click show in sidebar because then it will show up over here on the left side. All right, as next, we go back to the documentation and we copy this download script out of here, paste it in the terminal, press enter, and this will download our um, Hux into Home Assistant. It tells us though we need to restart the Home Assistant so we can do this. So we go to settings, over to system and restart the Home Assistant. All right, Home Assistant has restarted, it tells us down here and we can continue in our, doc in our documentation. The next thing is we need to configure Hux the first time. Uh, it tells us for us to go to device and services, integrations, and then add the Hux integration. So we do this, settings, device and services, and we click on add integration. And if we search for Hux, we see this new Hux integration. We acknowledge all of them and submit. Now it will, Hux needs a GitHub um, API key. Uh, you just need a GitHub account for this. So I copy this URL over here go over to my browser, enter this, copy the key from Hux, paste it in here, click continue, authorize this. And if we go back, it will tell us it has success and we can finish this. Now on the left side, we have a new Hux tab and we see all kinds of different um, systems configured. Now, the first thing we need to do is add our Hoss Miner integration. To do this, we go to the GitHub repository of Hoss Miner, which is on the github.com slash schnitzel slash Hoss Miner. We copy this, click on the top right on custom repositories and paste this in there and say this is an integration. So this will now add the Miner system to our 
um, to Hox, which is added to Home Assistant. And we see now here there's a new repository that we just added. Um, and we can click on that. And we see the different configuration, uh, the documentation about it. And we click on download and download this. Now this will download the integration into Home Assistant. So all of what we just have done, you need to do this one single one. This was needed to connect or to be able to connect miners to Home Assistant. From now on, you can add miners, you can configure it. All of this we, own, we don't need to do anymore. All right, let's our, add our first miner. To do this, we go to Settings, Devices, and we add an integration. Now, if you look here for miner, there's now a new one. This is the integration we just downloaded, and it's going to um, start up the configuration. And the first thing that it's going to ask us is for the IP address of the miners. Now, going back to this other tab here, we can see this, the miner is still running, and we also see the IP address, which, is, which ends in 1.10. So as soon as the configuration is done, it asks us for the IP address. We paste it in there without the HTTP and everything. Root and password. In this case, I only have root and no password. Again, I don't suggest you to do this, but it's much easier to do a demo of this. And I can submit this. It asks me um, the name for the miner, and I call it my garage miner. Submit this as well. I can add it to a specific living um, area if I want to and um, there's some additional things you can do with Home Assistant but it's not necessary and I'll finish. And now we see in this list of all the configured devices we see a new miner one and we see our garage miner. Um, and if we reload we can see that this host miner now automatically loads additional data from our Home Assistant um, which is really cool. Um, so it not only tells us that it's active and the power limit, which is right now at 3000 watts, it also tells us how much it's hashing right now, um, the total hash rate, how much watt it consumes, and even the temperature. So I'm going to put this next by each other. So I'm going to pull this one over here. So this is our miner over here that is currently running. And the integration right now updates every 30 seconds. So we can see every 30 seconds, this data over here will update based on what the UI shows. Um, but one of the really cool things is that Home Assistant now can also control the miners. So I can actually tell it to be active. I can press this one over here. And you can see on the right side, the miner start, stopped immediately mining. Um, the hash rate goes down, there's no temperature anymore. And also on the graph, we can see how this goes down. So this was now just Home Assistant telling the miner to turn off. And of course, I can also tell it to turn on again. Now this will take a couple of seconds um, because the miner actually internally reboots some of its configuration for this, um, which will always take a bit. Um, and we can also see actually it Home Assistant right now thinks it's turned off, but as soon as it will be running, um, it will update and also turn the miner back on. And so this is a way that you can now basically create a thermostat with your with your miners. Um, we can take the temperature sensor, um, measure the temperature, and based on that, turn the miner on and off. So let's try to do this. Um, we go um, to our settings, automation, and we see our two automations we created before for the oil pump. I'm going to delete them now because I don't need them anymore. And I'm going to create a new automation. And I say the trigger is a device, our temperature sensor. Um, this is connected to our hash top control. So if the garage temperature changes above, let's say, let's use 80 again, then we want to have an action. And now if we go to device, there's a new device in here. Our garage miner also shows up as a device. And I can tell it to turn off the garage miner. I'm going to save this and say turn miner off if above 80 Fahrenheit. And um, we're going to duplicate this again. And we say if the temperature is below 80, we're going to turn the garage miner on. So we run this one and say 
turn on garage minor if above if below 80. Now of course you could also use 75 and um, maybe just having the same temperature there is a bit of chance that it, that it um, jumps between them so um, yeah let's maybe change this let's say 79 degrees and also rename this 79 perfect no let's save this all right so if you go back we have our turn minor off if above 80 and turn minor on if below 79 so if we go back to our devices and um, look at our uh, ESP home, we can see the temperature right now is 70 Fahrenheit. Okay, instead of uh, jumping between these different devices all the time, let's actually create a dashboard with just our, um, just our devices on it. So we create a new dashboard from scratch and we call this the garage temp our thermostat and we have this one here so now we can edit the dashboard and we can add some devices so I want to add a list of entities so I don't want these here all right I want to have the garage miner if it's active or not and I can also search for temperature so the minor temperature there we go so these are the two things that I want Oh, sorry, not the temperature, sorry. The garage temperature. All right, so now we have a little dashboard. So what we expect now, if I take the, um, the temperature sensor in my hands and the temperature will go above 80, we should see that the miner itself should turn off and also we expect the miner over here, that is the dashboard that is real time to turn off as well. So I have the temperature sensor in my hands and the temperature is rising, 75, 78, 80, and we saw it turned off and also on over here at the, at the miners, we can see how it turned off and the hash rate is going down. We can also, by the way, we can see this if you make it a bit bigger and go to the log and scroll all the way down, we can see that it says interrupted by pause command. So this is the home assistant sending through the API to that miner that it should turn off. Now, if we cool down the temperature sensor again, put it in my little ice pack and we are below 75 or 80. And so it will now turn on the miner. Again, the switch you saw it shot the jump over and back that's just the reason that now the miner is actually booting again and um, but if we go to the log and scroll all the way to the bottom we can see resume command received meaning that it will automatically continue mining and in a couple of seconds we will see the miner to turn on again and be hashing again all right and this is how you can control your house with just a simple tem temperature sensor and the miner as well. Now, of course, in bigger setups like um, like mine, that um, also controls different sensors and things like that, it's a little bit more complex. But in the end, everything works this way. So I have all kind of different sensors, and I have different actors in Home Assistant, and I connect all of them through different automations and things like that. But I really suggest if you want to do this, start small, start with one temperature sensor. Um, and also uh, maybe one minor and from that point on later maybe add some more go some more complex things and yeah we can see on the right side our miner has already been starting to mine again so it will heat the temperature again and also home assistant realized that it's mining again all right that's it i hope you learned something if you want to learn more, uh, follow Nakamoto Heating Solutions on Twitter or check out our website. And if you have any questions around this, we're happy to help anytime. Thank you.